Welcome to class, everybody. My name is Ben Gramico. I am from InterNACHI. That's the International Association of Certified Home Inspectors. We're the world's largest organization of residential and commercial property inspectors. We essentially train and certify inspectors all over the world. And today is a live class, free, online, open to everyone. We do many of these classes. This one is about how to perform a home inspection according to a standards of practice. And what we're going to do is run through, oh, hundreds of images that I took during a recent home inspection. And we're going to stop along the way, ask questions, go over some information, show you, so show you some things that uh, you may not know. And um, everyone who registers for the class will receive a link to the video recording. So if you need to leave class early, no problem. If you'd like to ask questions, feel free to. Um, in the system, somewhere at the bottom right area there, there's a box with a blue border. You type in your questions, and I will try to answer them. However, <laughs> we have over 1,200 students registered for this class, so I may not be able to get to all the questions um, during class, but I'll try to answer them individually afterwards via email. Some logistics. You should be able to see me. I can't see you. Um, you should be able to hear me, hopefully. Um, I cannot hear you. But you can ask questions and um, often students talk among themselves, join the discussion with other students um, through that um, question and answer field that you have on your computer. So the first thing I'd like to do is go over these three web pages very quickly. Um, we have a lot to cover today. So the first one is really important. It's our contact page. Everyone on the InterNACHI staff is there. So if you need help with anything, membership, joining InterNACHI, um, updating your profile, um, job inspection leads, um, other programs like the Home Energy Score program, um, education, continuing ed, state submittals, anything you can think of, business services, um, marketing, design services. It's all through that contact page. And let me take you there quickly and show you what's there. We have a, a button here, a green button. Get quick answers immediately to commonly asked questions. You can use that or scroll down and there's staff. We're all there. Feel free to um, contact any one of them because we essentially work all together uh, shoulder to shoulder. So if you contact one, you'll be essentially contacting everybody. Uh, Natchi.org forward slash everything is where we put almost everything on one page. Sometimes it's difficult. Um, to find information on the Natchi site because it's so huge. Um, and that's okay. That's our fault. So we try to put um, essential things on this one page. And it's really for both veteran inspectors and new inspectors. And uh, it's a 15-step checklist on how to run a successful home inspection business. So take a look at that. Step one, step two, step three. And the third URL is the one you probably visited already, and it's our live class page, webinar page, where you can take a look at the upcoming classes and also jump down to the past classes. Um, all of the classes are video recorded, and they're all available online through this page. And every class um, is good for CE credits. Um, InterNACHI members can upload their CEs through their own members only account. And this class, if you attend it, is one hour credit. All right, so a lot of people can hear me, that's great. Um, people asking questions, Dimitri is asking about uh, software used to um, write this particular report for the inspection we're about to go over. Um, it is InspectView from Porter Valley. 
Um, we recommend um, Home Gauge and Home Inspector Pro. Those are really good software. Um, and they're, they are good for mobile devices as well. I recommend walking around um, and using a mobile device to write your report while you inspect. So let's do an inspection. We're gonna do an inspection on this house. And the first thing that I do is I go up on the roof. I usually arrive at the property about 15 minutes early, maybe 30 minutes early, uh, especially if it's vacant. And I wanna get up on the roof um, you are not required to get up on any roof surface. According to the standards of practice, no inspector is required to walk upon any roof surface, even a flat one or a sl low slope one. Um, but you are required to inspect it. And you can do that in several ways. Um, behind me is our drone. Uh, we use that for fun to make videos. Um, a lot of inspectors are using that for fun. And um, you can go to Inspector Outlet. They have a poll. Uh, we'll go there, actually. Um, a spectroscope. You can uh, use binoculars. You can use your eyes from the ground. If you have a ladder, you can lean it up against the gutter, um, maybe on the eave or the gable end. Um, get up to the roof and take a look. Um, again, you do not have to... Uh, you don't have to work, uh, walk on any roof surface. So we have a couple poles. One of the main poles that I want to ask is, are you a member of InterNACHI? If you could answer this real quick so we can get going. Um, it's really important to us to know if you are a member of InterNACHI attending this class. Um, that would be great to know. So I'm looking, and 75% of you have voted. Um, I'll give it another five seconds, uh, over 80% have voted. Um, Carlos, I see you just typed in that you're a student member. Yep, any kind of member. Um, if you join in and actually you become a member and then you become certified um, after be, uh, taking the training. So let's close the poll. Most of you have answered, 90% of you have answered. So let's take a look at the results. Yep, so a lot of you, almost three quarters of you um, attending this class are members of InterNACHI. Um, a lot of you are interested in joining InterNACHI, which is great to know. So if you are interested in joining InterNACHI, go back to that contact page and you can email me and I will um, help you, especially if you're interested in joining um, today. So what I do is my brand is to carry big, tall ladders. My brand is that which distinguishes me from my competition. Um, it's that which can't be said by my competition. So my competition in my area, it was a tough area. I used to be a home inspector for 13 years. Southeastern PA, Philadelphia, suburbs, maybe 150 inspectors in my market area, 20 mile radius. They're all very excellent. So to beat your competition, you have to figure out what your brand is. And... <clears throat> My one brand was, a uh, type of my brand is, um, carrying tall ladders. I carried a 40-foot aluminum, 32-foot fiberglass, 28-foot fiberglass, 12-foot aluminum, step ladder, crawl gear. So from the very top to the very bottom. Again, you don't have to walk upon any roof surface, but I did to beat my competition. And I was also trained. Uh, before a home inspector, I used to build homes and install roofs. And then I take pictures. That's another part of my brand. I take hundreds of digital pictures, the same pictures that you're looking at. That's my hand. And I provide all of those images of the inspection and video, I used to take video, to my clients. Every one of my clients gets a little, I used to print them to CD, now USB. Now you can do it you know, as a download. And I make sure that my clients and anyone reading my inspection report, because my inspection report was passed around by my clients, so I gave multiple copies of full color printed inspection reports um, in a binder with a home maintenance book and marketing materials, a couple of them to my clients because they take one, but then they give away the other ones to friends at the office who are also moving and looking for a home inspector or to their real estate agents. So my inspection report was actually the most important piece of marketing 
that I could work on. And I worked on my inspection reports every day, and I included in my inspection reports that which distinguishes me from all the rest. And this did it. Um, my feet on the roof. Oh, so if you don't want to inspect the roof with your feet, that's fine. You're not required to. But if you go to Inspector Outlet, our e-commerce partner is inspectoroutlet.com. I really like this. We've had this around for a while. It's a spectroscope. So if you can see, um, it's 38 feet extended. There's the digital camera there. And it's connected Wi-Fi to your device down there. And it collapses into a little pole, only about six and a half feet tall. So it can, you can put it right in your truck or strap it on your ladder rack. So when I inspect the roof, I inspect every roof surface. I try to walk around as much as possible, and I take pictures of every field or plane, and then every intersection and every component, especially all the penetrations. And I'm looking for anything cracked or damaged, the condition of the roof, I'm trying to estimate the age. It's not required, but I try to give my client an idea. Is it brand new or really old? If I can give that information to them, very general information, I feel I've done a very good service because they're not going to get up on the roof. I won't let them. Anyways, um, looking at chimney flashings, right? Anything that intersects this roof covering material. And when you are reporting the condition of the roof, make sure you're reporting what you want to say. If you say the roof in general, that's the entire system, including fastening, underlayment, flashing that you can't see. So when I speak about when I communicate about the condition of the roof, I'm going to talk specifically about the roof covering material because that's really all I can see. It's all that's visible to me. And there's the vent stack. That's a cast iron pipe. It's the only one. It's an older house. Main stack coming up through the roof. And there's the flashing around it. The boot looks good. Installed well. And there's um, ventilation. You have to inspect the ventilation. There's a powered roof fan there. Um, it might be kind of old. Um, it wasn't turned on during the inspection. It's a little chilly, um, so I'm going to go up in the attic space. I have to remember that systems are interdependent with one another. They, they, um, you alter one component of a system, and it could alter another system. So things on the roof have an impact on a lot of things, including indoor air quality, ventilation, insulation, um, attic condition, things like that. So while I'm inspecting, I'm taking pictures. These actually help me later on while I'm compiling the report, adding photographs to the report. Um, remind me of the condition of the systems and components that I found, and also um, making sure that I add things, that some details that I can't remember. That's why it's really important for me as an inspector to write the report while I was inspecting. And the software nowadays can do that. They have those software. You can buy software that goes on your desktop, your laptop, PC, Mac, or your mobile devices, your Droid, um, your tablet, your iPhone, iPad. So there's a gable vent. There's also a ridge vent. So I'm taking pictures of all the components of the ventilation. Now there's a standard of practice that you've got to follow. It's a minimum standard. And this is the Internet G standards of practice. And it's broken up into systems, roof, basement, cooling, plumbing. So let's take a look at the roof. The inspector shall inspect from the ground level or the eaves. Nope, you don't have to walk on any roof. The roof covering materials, the gutters, the downspouts, the vents, flashing, skylights, chimney, and other roof penetrations, and the general structure of the roof from readily accessible panels, doors, stairs. You're required to describe the type of roof covering materials and report as a need of correction any observed indications of active roof leaks. So that's what you're required. There's a lot of disclaimers, what you're not required to do as well. Now, let's say your weakness is you've taken our, let's say you've taken our online inspector exam, which identifies strengths and weaknesses. So you can take that exam to see where you need training. And let's say you're weak in roof. 
Well, Internet provides free online training courses to all of our members. You join Internet and you're essentially a student member, just like uh, Dimitri asked. I think it was Dimitri, someone. Um, and then um, you have, as a member, you have access, unlimited access to all of our online courses, and they're all free to members from anywhere, unlimited access on any device. And for example, here are the courses that relate to roof. We have all of these courses. We don't just have one course about roofs. We have many. There's how to perform roof inspections, general roof inspection training video. It's all video, video based. 10 steps to perform a roof inspection, inspecting asphalt, wood, tile, metal, slate, wind and hail, and even a ladder safety course if you're going to use a ladder. And just to give you a, an idea, let's take a look at the 10 steps course. And that's me. So high wind efficient changes, shedding water. So it's all video based. I always take a picture of the trip by Jerry. And it's HD. And um, it's a pretty good, sweet course, short and sweet. So if you're weak in roof, or maybe you're a veteran, but you maybe should know a little bit more than you ought to, which is a, um, a situation that I'm usually in. Um, I'm better off knowing more. Um, you can take our courses. Not required to inspect the interior flue liner. Not required. But I've got a camera in my hand. And I don't know how many times I've taken a picture of this. The first section of the flue, the top section of the flue of the chimney, and find a, an obvious defect. Right? Um, I'm only going to tell them that if I find a defect, I'm going to tell them what I find and if it's in the image because I am not required to inspect all the way down there. It's 30 feet. It's impossible for an eye to look through that. You can't see through that. It's filled with spider webs. Um, and uh, the shape of the chimney I know is, um, is not a fireplace. It's square. So I'm assuming there's some kind of uh, fuel burning appliance. And there's the chimney condition. Uh, the chimney flashing. There's the fireplace, rectangular flue. It's got a nice wash or crown on the top. Looks like some somewhat recent. I would love to see a sealant to make a bond break. That's okay. And there's the hood there. And the flashing is good. Um, the crown or wash uh, on the heating system chimney uh, isn't all that great. Could be patched up a little bit, but not too bad. Fireplaces, those chimneys, you folks in the south really don't come across much of this, but um, maybe three quarters of the United States and Canada um, uh, really deal with these things. And it's really important to understand how to inspect them. That's why we have one of the best courses on how to inspect fireplaces, stoves, and chimneys. And um, there's a couple, here's, a, here's a, a typical slide from one of our courses. You have text. You have really nice images. Um, some of them, you know, I just showed the uh, video of the roof inspection course and um, with quizzes and final exam and a certificate. So while I'm coming off the roof, hopefully by the time I'm done with the roof inspection, I'm taking digital images. I'm writing the report as I go. I'm taking video. I have two cameras. I like to carry two cameras. My hands, they need to hold something. These mobile devices are just not, uh, you know, how many times have I dropped my iPhone? So you need like a really nice camera with a grip. One's all pictures, one's video, and then I upload that. Um, it takes a few minutes, but um, it's well worth it. And hopefully my client pulls up before I get off the ladder, uh, get on the ladder from the roof, and I wave to them while I'm on the roof. That's part of my brand to make sure that they understand while they're pulling up into the driveway to see their nice new home while, during the home inspection, that they see their home inspector up on the roof waving to them. Got there early. I come down. The first thing I do is I put a big smile on my face. I shake their hand and I pull out a ton of business cards. Not one, a ton, real thick, stack. Get it ready in your pocket, shirt pocket. Have at least five to 10 because they're going to pass them out to everyone. Just like your home maintenance book that you give out. You don't just give out one, you give out many. Just like your inspection report, you don't just give out one, you give out many because your client will have one and then distribute for you 
like an ambassador your marketing materials. So it's a very simple, basic concept. It's marketing 101. Pass out many business cards. Uh, the gutters are filled with debris. And I think of water when I inspect. Um, now I'm in Colorado, it barely rains here. But when I was in Pennsylvania, we call it, um, we think of water, how the structure sheds water. It's the roof first, slipped away, it's maybe caught or diverted, and it's directed down to the foundation area, to the grade level, and diverted away from the ground, uh, diverted away from the structure, right? So I'm looking at downspouts, gutters, downspouts, and diverting that water away from the foundation with sloped grading. So I want to actually take pictures of all of the downspouts. This one needs adjusted. It's pooling right next to the corner. This one um, is not hitting the splash block at all. It's just dumping hundreds of gallons of water right next to one spot, right next to the foundation, even though it's masonry. Masonry is, oh, is to, like a sponge. It'll just wick that water right up. And I'm taking a look at the grading around the house. It's a bit complicated. It has a lot of gardens and steps and bushes, so I can't really see everything. I want to make sure that I explain that in my report with a little check mark, you know, limited inspection, but a picture is worth a thousand words. That's a lot of stuff right up against the house. Can't, can hardly see anything. Like the windows, can't see them. This is a basement window, a window well. Mm, could be a crawl space too. Not sure until I get in. And it's in poor shape. The plastic cover is shot. It's allowing water to come in. The window well is filling up with dirt and water and moisture. You can see that that's wet. Um, this is the best tool to test water. We all have them. We all carry them around. Use um, the back of your hand or your fingers to feel moisture. Oh, and when I used to do an inspection, uh, especially with a, a real estate agent that I didn't know, I'm familiar with my services, they would assume that the inspection is not going to identify problems. Hopefully not. But we would talk about home maintenance a lot. And I would, to, I would have to explain to my client and their real estate agent that this isn't a home maintenance inspection. This is a home inspection. I'm trying to find problems. And I'm going to identify them in writing with pictures and video if I see them. Uh, so to get rid of that home maintenance issue, I provided a home maintenance book really early on. And that was another part of my brand. I would include home maintenance books. And Shazam, Internet she has one. It's titled, Now That You've Had a Home Inspection. And it reinforces, it helps limit your liability by reinforcing to your client that they are now responsible for maintaining their home. And that future conditions of, your, of their home is the responsibility of who? The new homeowner. Welcome to home ownership. I've done my job. I've found the problems that I that were. Um, I've uh, reported the in, in indications of observed defects. Have to be careful on how you write your defects. And um, maintaining the home is your problem. Future leaks, plumbing leaks, roof leaks, um, discovered defects. Um, that's the responsibility of the homeowner, not the home inspector. So. This is a great brand piece, marketing piece. And we actually, if you're in Florida, we have one just for Florida. Now that you've had a home inspection in Florida, you won't find any basements or oil boilers in this book. And we also have a Spanish version as well. Aquí. So for your Spanish speaking clients as well. Ah. So I would like to ask, do you use a home maintenance book? Do you provide a home maintenance book? Do you provide some kind of guide for your clients? Something extra that helps explain what you do, the scope of your inspection, it helps you reduce liability. Um, most of you are voting. I'm going to give it five more seconds. We're up to 70% of you voted. Over 70. 
If you can answer that, we'd really like to know. Do you provide a free home maintenance book to every client? It's really a great idea. Here's the results. Yeah, it's kind of split right down the line. Yes and no. Some of you do, some of you don't. And some of you are interested in internet cheese. That's really cool. That's excellent, excellent actually. Um, I think internet cheese is the best, especially if you're a member of internet cheese. I'm a little biased, as you may. So, but there are other books out there. Uh, you can download and make your own PDF or something. But um, this is well designed. It's full color on the inside and out. And one thing that you may not know, two things. Every chapter starts with the standards of practice limitations, what you're required to inspect and not required to inspect. And also it has about a dozen reasons to hire you again um, as part of a home maintenance plan. Then I take a look at the um, not only the grading around the house, but the stairs, stoops, walks. This one is a trip hazard. It's leaning. It's kind of high. Taking all the looking at all the pictures. So while I'm taking pictures, I'm thinking of the requirements for the standards of practice, but I'm following a procedure. I actually do the same thing over and over again. I go clockwise around the house. I actually come down the roof, shake my client's hand. Hopefully they're there. Give them uh, business cards, a ton of business cards. Tell them, uh, ask them, would you like to go around the exterior? If they say yes, I take them around the exterior, show them a few things. This is going to be my first time around, so I'm looking for the big stuff, the major defects, so maybe some of the little things. And then I send them in to take measurements, look at the, what they're going to do with the kitchen and bathroom, um, the carpeting, the paint, and stuff like that. I tell them, I'm going to go around one more time on the outside, and I'll see you inside. And then we'll take a look at the really cool stuff, like the heating system, electrical. That leaves me alone, and I go around the outside, and I'm doing detail now. And I'm thinking about procedure and what I'm required according to the SOP. And the SOP is kind of like a minimal guide. Helps me do a couple things. Helps me understand what I'm supposed to do. <laughs> Tells me exactly what I'm required to do but it provides a foundation for me to move beyond the standards of practice and provide additional information, which is uh, optional for inspectors to exceed the standards of practice. All right, a lot of questions coming in, but let's answer a few after we take a look at what you're required to inspect for the exterior. And it is exterior wall coverings and materials, flashing and trim, all exterior doors, adjacent walkways, Driveways, stairs, stoops, stairs, stairways, ramps, porches, patios, decks, balconies, carports, a lot of things. Handrails, guardrails, eaves, soffit, fascia, a representative number of windows, and vegetation, surface drainage, retaining walls, grading, where they may be adversely affecting the property. It's a lot to inspect. So the software helps you. I use the SOP for this, the second reason I use the SOP is to help me program or structure my software so it mirrors the standards of practice. So I have the standards of practice. It helps me physically move around the property, and it also helps me write a report. And so my report reflects what I inspected and how I inspected, which reflects the standards of practice. It's all like congruence, incongruence with each other, in alignment and harmony with each other reflective of each other. One isn't completely different. They're all the same thing. And then I give them the home maintenance book. Don't mean to push it so much, but the home maintenance book is actually like the icing on the cake. It reinforces what I did. Every chapter is about the standards of practice. And it tells them, this is what I did. It's now your responsibility to maintain it. Let's say you're weak in exterior. We have a ton of courses for the, on the subject of exterior, including my buddy Mike Nelson, he came to our studio and did a, a video, um, and so he's inspecting a home. It's called The Fundamentals of Inspecting the Exterior. He's a fantastic trainer, and so um, that training course is all about inspecting the exterior, and it's free and online to members. Uh, let's see. Taking a look at the questions. Do any states require smoke and CO detectors in the garage? 
student member. Oh, so um, there is definitely code that you can refer to, and we're going to take a look at some code and standards or best practices. Um, there's the International Residential Code, which we, um, this 2015 came out. So we'll take a look at that. But um, your local code inspector, authority having jurisdiction, AHJ, um, can interpret the code any way they want. Um, so I'm going to refer to you the International Standards of Practice, uh, International Residential Code, sorry, but it's really your local code that takes precedence over everything. Yeah, do you mention counteracting ventilation? Um, yes, but only briefly. I tell them ideally what you want is uh, a passive roof ventilation system, which is really nice and common place for a sloped roof where you have um, the soffits and the ridge vent. Uh, and that was Sean is asking that. Um, Sean um, spelled it in a different way. Um, I'm a new inspector. Did about 20 shadow inspections with a 20 year inspector. They advise only to photo identify what is wrong. Do you agree with this? No. Um, simply because we do case studies and no one um, that I know of, I haven't heard of any news of an inspector providing too much information. Um, so that's what you're really doing. And if you're fearful of taking a, an image of a defect and then telling your client uh, via the image that there's a defect at the house, well, that, that's an issue that you should be able to solve simply by taking a picture of the image and putting it in your report. So all of your images are that important. What's really bad is if you um, don't see the defect and you don't take the picture, right? What you want to do, what you want to do is um, provide your client with as much information as possible about what you see with your flashlight, with your infrared camera, with your photo camera, with your video camera, and share all that information to your client. When, if you take a picture of a hole in the roof and you don't put it in the report, well, you may have an issue there. It may be a lack of training. You may not be a great inspector. But certainly, if you take a picture of a defect, it ought to go in the report. And you certainly should share it with your client. That's just my personal opinion. There is no standard. It's really up to you. I've never heard of anyone getting in trouble of providing too many photographs. It's just not. Your client will probably not even look at them. We have real data that says that most um, home buying clients don't read the inspection report. All they really read is what you say during the inspection. They're reading you, what you say, and maybe a summary sheet. So they're not even looking at the images. Um, I did it for 13 years. I provided each client with all of the information that I provided. Um, it was really great, and it was actually part of my brand. And so um, I think that's just a question of whether you feel confident enough in your abilities or not. Uh, let's see. Oscar. The downspout is fine on first roof. I don't know what that means, Oscar. All right. There's a couple other questions. Um, can the maintenance book be offered with a three-hole punch for binder? Yeah, so they're all drilled. They're all pre-drilled for binders. Um, I used to buy a half-inch binder, um, nice red binder, so it stands out. Uh, it was customized. Internachi has some through our e-commerce partner, Inspector Outlet. They provide um, really good, um, nice, nice ones with pockets on the inside. Um, drip edges, are they required? According to the standards of practice, oh, sorry, according to the International Residential Code, um, they mention drip edges, but again, local authority having jurisdiction over rules. We can take a look at that. Um, since it's your brand, Rob asks, do you walk steep roofs? No, I only do things that are safe. See, things are absolutely safe. I love 212 to 412. That's my area. Um, anything bigger than that, I just don't go up. Um, but I do have a big ladder, so I get up to the gable edge. What I like to, to do is pull that shingle tab up and take a look at the edge, look at the, the flashing, and also the number of layers. That helps me a lot. Um, let's see. 
how do I upload the CE credit to my account? Uh, you just log in and go to your tool um, that says um, uh, continuing ed. All right, let's keep going. So I measure all, I carry out a measuring tape and because you have to measure uh, several things. One of them is this easy thing, this is an easy defect. So it's spaced too far apart, the spindles. So is that one. So is that one. Um, the condition of the deck is good. It's fastened down well, except some of the nails are backing out. So that's a really cool micro um, setting on your camera. Um, any tread area at a door or slider. When I take a look at a window, I go top left, top right, bottom left, bottom right. Even a door, a slider door like this one in the back. And I can't get underneath the deck. So that's an inspection restriction. Plus, we're also missing some components of the lattice, kind of minor, but it could be a big problem for your client. I can't gauge sometimes. Sometimes new buyers pick on this stuff. So I try to guide them into what really matters during an inspection. This really doesn't matter, but I'm going to take a picture of it. I'm going to give it to my client. I'm going to give the picture to my client. I'm going to tell them that it's cosmetic. Lattice is not a big deal. Driveway surfaces, hard surfaces are important. Take a look at the parking. There's um, old paint, bad sealant, bad caulking around this second floor gable window. I can only see it from the, the ground. And there's also some slight rusting of the steel lintel above the window. So I take a look at that and I put it in the report. I actually have all of these statements written down already in my report, and I just click select, and then that sentence appears in my report. So you have to use software um, to be fast, and that's that mobile device really speeds up my inspection. If it speeds up the way I write a report, um, then I can, I can invest more time in inspecting and taking my client around the house slower and finding more things that they ought to know, like this loose light fixture. No GFCIs. In fact, according to the lights, it's reverse polarity, right? And that's a basic um, tester where you can do something more aggressive that tests GFCIs and AFCIs. Um, I also carry around a moisture meter because my hand is pretty good, but um, I like to um, maybe probe with this. Yeah. Um, these are just devices. So your flashlight is a device, your GFCI tester is a device, moisture meter is a device. But I don't quantify anything, I qualify. I'm in the world of anomalies. There's something odd looking. I'm going to report it and recommend further evaluation. That's my life. Um, I don't measure anything to a degree. Um, I don't quantify any, anything. So um, this moisture meter gives me uh, an indication of um, moisture. Give me a little red light there and a little sound. That's all I want. I really don't care what the moisture level is. That's not my world. We don't quantify it. We're generalists. Um, and which brings me also to this fella here. Um, it's kind of like a second flashlight. So it's my infrared camera. This is a FLIR C2, actually. Um, FLIR makes a, a nice set of cameras. You can get this camera off of our e-commerce partner, Inspector Outlet. This is a very low resolution device. You don't even have to use the word infrared, but it's a device like my flashlight. Flashlight helps me see things with my eyes that I can't normally see without it. Same thing with this guy. This guy looks at temperatures of the surface of things. Um, it's only a few hundred bucks. Um, you can get a, a, this is 80 by 60, a very low resolution. may not be for you. If you like high resolution um, for seeing things in high res, you can get that. There's my fan. You can tell my fan's on. There's my desk. Tell a few things on my desk. I just turned on the moisture meter, so it's kind of warm. Um, there's a sign there about our pre-inspection moving certified.com. There's my, and what it really does is it just allows me to see things that I can't normally see. So I don't know if you can see that, but I'm uh, 10 feet away. 
12 feet away, I could probably go 30 feet away and see that with this low res uh, infrared camera. It's very affordable. It just tells me anomalies. I wouldn't normally see with my eyes. If you want really high res stuff, yeah, that's that's possible. But um, you know, you have to figure out what works for you. So just a little bit on that infrared and infrared certified um, is a um, a training certification program that we have. Um, it's online. Uh, John McKenna is one of our excellent master trainers. He has a live class that you can take for a fee. Um, and there's some deals um, with that as well for non-members. All right, let's get going. We're really, there's 40 minutes into it. We're not even inside the home yet. So frost-free hose bibs. Um, in cold climates, you need frost-free hose bibs. These are not. They're going to freeze and burst. And here's the dryer vent, which I realized was a dryer vent later on. Um, I thought it was maybe a kitchen or an old, um, maybe a pellet stove exhaust or something, but this is a dryer vent. And the vent is only three inches in diameter. It's all messed up. That's too small. How do I know that? Well, um, Internet actually wrote a course, uh, wrote an article about inspecting the dryer vent. And I know that from this, uh, it has to be at least four inches in diameter, the dryer exhaust pipe. Um, and that is based upon a code. Um, and here's a, a link to codes. International Code Council, a fantastic organization, has put all their codes online for free, and you can read them. And here they are. International Building Code, 2015. Um, there's a um, code for swimming pools. Um, there's the fire code. Here's the one that InterNACHI uh, training courses are based upon. The 2000, well, the International Residential Code. This one is the 2015. And if you go to, uh, mm, what, what chapter is it? Chapter 15, Exhaust Systems. And uh, the section is, there it is. The duct shall be four inches nominal in diameter. So it's about clothes dryer exhausts. So as an inspector, we're not code inspectors. We're generalists. We don't quote code. We don't say the word code. In Texas, you get in trouble if you say the word code, et cetera. But uh, everything you do, um, your knowledge that you have, the skills, the abilities, your knowledge really comes from best practices, which are based upon safe ways to build things, efficient ways, so that things perform in a safe, efficient manner, which is built upon code, standards of building, so that they perform well and safe. As soon as somebody gets hurt in a building, code changes. It's really important. So a home that was built 30 years ago, we home inspectors, we inspect existing homes, right? It was built to code back then. That doesn't mean anything. Just like the spindle spaces. Remember the spindle spaces are too big? Back then, that was built to code. Now you have to have it narrow so that a child's head can't fit through the railing and they don't hurt themselves. Right? We're trying to prevent that from happening. And that's built upon code, knowledge of code. And when I looked at that dryer exhaust, I knew almost intuitively something's wrong. If this is a dryer exhaust, this is too small. It's too small in my hand. I measure it. It's too small in my measurement. It's got to be four inches. Why do I know that? Code. So use code and your standards of practice as a foundation upon which to perform a really great inspection. And when someone says to you, why do you think it's four inches? You could always then refer to code, but I wouldn't put it in your report. Just say the standard practices, the best practices, my recommendation is. Uh, let's see, phone, uh, kitchen hood. Actually, they sealed it up. Um, they nailed it shut and put sealant on it. It doesn't open anymore. Air conditioning. Um, so standards of practice, there's a link to the standards of practice for air conditioning. We have a few excellent courses on how to inspect heating and cooling, especially this one. Advanced training, because it's all video, and it's advanced because we tear apart every system into little components. So we actually take pictures of that's a, the burners, the ribbon burners. Um, there's Kenton Shepard. Certified master inspector, master trainer. He takes apart 
um, with a technician, every component of every type of system, um, every efficiency, low, medium, high, very high efficiency, heating and cooling systems. And um, it's, it's one of the best. There's another one. There's an induced draft system. And there's a heat exchanger as well. So take a look at our courses. Again, all of our InterNACHI's courses are online and free to members. And um, members, regardless of whether you're new or old. Um, foam around the suction line, uh, the large diameter line is the suction line. Um, there's the manufacturing date. So I know it's 1989, but um, a lot of people ask me, a lot of inspectors ask me, what do I do to figure out how old the unit is according to the serial number or the model number? Um, here it is. So I'm going to give you this link. It's called buildingcenter.org, another great organization that works really hard to develop this um, data. So I'm going to click HVAC. Taking a look at this um, air conditioner model number. I know it's a York. That's the make, manufacturer. And um, York has a couple ways that they do their serial numbers based upon the year. Um, this serial number, if we go back, right, is four letters and a bunch of numbers. So I'm looking for four letters, and it's MFWM, MFWM. Now go back here. Here's the four letters. M, well, I, I could care less about the plant. MF, month, I don't really don't care about the month. MFW, that's the year, and it's... Shazam, 1989. So um, this is a really great um, resource. We get back to that. So I would actually program that in, bookmark it, save it, use it. Um, if you're into trying to figure out the exact month and year that the appliance, HVAC, or um, they have uh, water heater tanks, um, if you want to get the year of manufacturing date from that. Um, move on a little bit on the base of the air conditioning, a little rust, minor stuff. Um, overhead electric coming through the trees, not a good idea. Um, there's a light fixture that's damaged, that's not a good idea. Um, we have electrical courses, we have fantastic electrical courses. Um, I don't want to take you there, but go to the advanced electrical course because we're running out of time. I want to respect your one hour here. So I take a look at all the components of the electrical system. I'm still outside. I haven't even gotten on the inside. How many systems have we inspected just on the exterior? Many. Because a house is a system. It's a, it, the house is a system of interdependent parts. One part affecting all other parts. And this electrical system, these components will have an impact of other systems in the house. And I'll show you that if we get to it, actually, we're running a little bit late. I try to pull the meter off of the house. Sometimes they fall into my hand. Um, the condition of the conduit line, the sheath around the line going to the electrical panel, um, that area there should be sealed up. That's really minor, but I include that photo with my report. There's the grounding wire, grounding rod, acorn, um, all manual thermostats should be replaced by automatic thermostats. There's some really high-tech ones out there, um, but these manual ones, they essentially um, lose heat. They lose energy. Sorry, they, they lose energy. They waste energy. And for this system, um, for this class, I, I picked a natural draft. There aren't many of these around anymore. They stopped making them a while back. Um, this is a natural draft gas-fired furnace. You should be able to identify that from 10 feet away if you've taken InterNACHI's training courses. So I can identify the fuel source. It's natural gas, right? Um, I'm looking for a shutoff valve. I see a drip. No shutoff valve. It's actually above. And then there's the hood. For intake, there's the flue pipe, large diameter flue pipe, metal. Um, service switch, I use that. Um, I turn the fan on, actually, and then I run downstairs, and I use the switch to turn it off, and I pull things apart and put things back together again, turn the service switch on, run upstairs, turn the heating system on, 
run downstairs and look. I usually have about four seconds. I want to look at the flame and how it ignites. There are other ways of doing it too, having the service switch off until you are actually right in front of the heating system or cooling system to watch it perform after you turn it on. It's another one of the ways. Um, shut off gas, the burners, um, orange, really. So that's an old, that's a bad condition. Um, just needs cleaned. But I see some scorching and overheating coming out of the edges of the heat shield. That's no good. That could be many things. Poor draft, could be, it's a natural draft, kind of common on an old heating system, but that is not good. I actually get my screwdriver and tap that stuff. If my screwdriver goes in, um, we got to shut that thing down because I don't want any carbon monoxide. Um, and look at all that stuff. So there's oxides, there's backdrafting, there's overheating, there's spillage, um, so damage. So this is really good stuff for your client to know. And there's the natural draft hood. So there's the heat exchanger, passes through. The burners and ribbons are on the bottom. Hot exhaust gases pass through the heat exchanger, serpentine up, um, come out the top, and then they draft up naturally with the uh, flue pipe into the chimney stack. And you can see there's a lot of stuff going on here. Could be a dangerous situation. Or maybe there was. And then we have um, condensate, indications of condensate that um, building up in the flue, inside the flue, um, because you can see the uh, white chalky stuff, um, oxides. Um, if you take our heating course, I promise you, you'll learn about this condensate. Um, what the indications are, what combustion, um, the calculation, what what combustion, good combustion is, and what incomplete combustion is, and we talk about um, nitrogen oxide and um, acids and all that good stuff. So this is dripping um, from condensate from a, a poor draft probably, but I really don't know. I'm not the HVAC tech. All I report on are the indications of a defect and recommend further evaluation by a professional. There's the flue pipes going in, not sealed very well from the hot water tank, more condensation leaks. Um, there's the clean out. I like to pull that open and take a shot up the flue. Um, humidifier, water source for the humidifier. Um, for you folks in humid clim climates, we actually do this in the north where it's cold and dry. Um, we have humidifiers. We dump a lot of humid air into the house interior, amazingly, by dripping water down a filter. And this filter needs to be changed every month. And this is, um, you can see the calcium deposits building up. And there's the deep pleated media filter, air filter. Um, needs to be cleaned. Can last maybe more than 30 days, up to 90. And there's the air conditioner, refrigerant line, serial model number. Refrigerant line goes into something that looks like a vent for a crawl space. So I'm all excited about that. Condensate, I take a picture of the service date. We have courses on plumbing. We're coming up to the plumbing system. Um, while I'm at the HVAC, I go to the plumbing and then we'll go to other systems. Gas fire, and there's gas shot off, natural draft. The bottom of the tank is rusting. It's an old tank. Um, even there's something going on with the heat shield where the burner is cold water, temperature. So I, I take a picture of the serial and model number and the manufacturer. Um, it's a Bradford White. I can go to buildingcenter.org. I can look up the age of the water heater right there. I click on Bradford White right there, and it gives me this chart, this table, right? It's very easy if you want to do that. It's an easy way of doing it. Great group, that. Um, that building center. There's their website, buildingcenter.org. Uh, missing a TPR valve extension. Um, inspection restrictions in front of the electrical panel. There's a grounding wire. There's the electrical panel itself. You're not required to open the electrical panel to remove the dead front cover. Um, but there's the main shutoff. Um, not all the breakers are labeled. I take the panel off safely. I'm trained to do so. Um, if you're weak on electrical, we have a lot of really great electrical courses. I don't see anything wrong on the inside. Um, way too many wires on that one clamp. If I move on, not that bad. There's a, a 
timer off for something. I'm not even sure where it went. Could have been something outside for a light. Sometimes it's for a hot water tank, electric hot water tank, but we have a gas-fired hot water tank. Um, the main stack, about eight feet of it is visible to me. Inspection restriction. Um, no leaks. There's the dryer exhaust. That needs to be replaced. Um, fire hazard. Run water at all the fixtures. Laundry tub. I'm trying to go a little bit fast here. Missing GFCI. There's um, indications of prior water leaks. Um, there could be a bathroom up above the laundry right there. They patch that up. I take a picture of just about everything, especially uh, discoloration of a ceiling. First floor ceilings when there's a second floor bathroom um, right above the kitchen or hallway. It's a really good place to take a look at for defects. Um, shut off valve going to the outside. Inspection restrictions. There's a garage, garage door, manual garage, no garage door opener, and um, it, the driveway surface of the driveway is higher than the garage. So there's water coming in. I'm not sure what that pressure-treated piece of wood is going to do. Nothing. So they really need to attend to that. Water's just going to come in. And if this is a cold climate that snows, snow's going to pile up, melt, and you're going to have water intrusion into the garage. No big deal, right? It's concrete floor, but... I, it could be a huge deal for someone. Um, maybe they're going to finish the garage. So, And the garage door, uh, the door between the garage, so be a fire rated door. This one is not. A lot of inspection restrictions. I love this one, right? Can't really see everything, but I love to see wood sitting on concrete, and there's signs of efflorescence or dampness or wicking in the past. I mean, that's just an invite for subterranean termites. Um, so I, that kind of gets me going. That's why I want to take pictures of everything because I know that that could be a problem. So I stick my nose in there and see what's going on. Speaking of noses, um, I inform my clients if I see indications of pets, particularly cats. So there's that, take a picture of that. I don't talk about urine. I don't go crazy over it. I just tell them that I see indications of pets in the house. And then the back side of the garage actually is the crawl space access. So, yeah, there's a lot of a lot of problems with that. Um, and the crawl space itself is built upon a very old stone foundation, and the stone foundation is leaking and it's filling up the crawl space with water. Literally, there's indications of flooding in there of a couple inches, and it's not ventilated, which is nice, but it's um, not handled quite right. Um, crawl spaces really should be handled like many basements, short basements. So the trend is, and the research and the building science is to go away from, un to go away from vented crawl spaces even in human climates, and build or retrofit unvented crawl spaces that are kind of like mini short basements. So um, we go over that in our moisture course, and there's a link to the moisture course. Looks like they added insulation just before I arrived on the crawl space floor. Um, it's not installed properly. Um, it's, you know, there's, a, there's many things wrong, and it depends on whether you want this crawl space ventilated or not. And this crawl space is ventilated. So unfortunately, it's ventilated. Um, it really, they have, a, they have a lot of research saying that um, we should treat crawl spaces as unventilated, conditioned crawl spaces. So I'm looking for really um, wood damage, WDO, indications of WDO, indications of damage by insects. Um, water, mold, um, issues like missing insulation or indications of prior water leaks. There could be a bathroom above me. And the stone, well, each stone is like a sponge. It absorbs groundwater and wicks it in and releases all that moisture. And there's the flooding, indications of a few inches of water in the crawl space. and the piping and the ducts, looking for anything. So as you can see, I take a lot of pictures, hundreds of pictures, and for some reason they're 
dumping conditioned air into a vented crawl space. So they, these folks really don't know building science and they need some help. And um, we have um, a really great course on moisture and foundations and advanced video um, training course on crawl spaces. Um, and uh, I encourage you to take a look at that, whether you're new or old to the business. Um, let's see, what can I do? It's 11 o'clock. I'm going to go real quick. I see a ton of you um, have questions, but I'm going to go and try to finish um, our run through of this inspection. And um, there's the power fan. There's indications of um, prior water leaks, compressed insulation, moved insulation, and um, some uh, other stuff from mice. Indications of pests. Um, we have a course on attic insulation and ventilation and interiors. We have several courses, uh, including an appliance inspection course. It's a really great course on how to inspect appliances in the kitchen. And then as you go along, I'm looking for um, bathroom fans and kitchen exhaust fans. And they should all exhaust outside, not to the attic, but directly outside. And this one is a bath fan directly exhausting into the attic. Uh, cold climate, so it condenses in the wintertime, in the bay, in the roof rafters, uh, on the roof deck, and that's in mold. Observed indications of mold uh, during the inspection. And you could sample for mold. Um, sampling is really, um, sometimes it's just not useful at all. But if, you're, if, if it looks like mold, EPA essentially says if it looks like mold, it's probably mold and you don't really need to sample, and I can send you that link to the EPA. But if you wanted to sample, I always carry one of these. Um, I got get this from ProLab uh, down in Florida, and it's a, just a swab stick. So you swab it, you stick it in the tube, send it out, they come back, whether it's mold or not. And um, usually when I sample what I think is mold, it's, it's mold. So it's just a confirmation of what I observed. And maybe my client wants it or not. But there's the fan, bath fan, second floor bath fan, exhausting into the attic. Missing GFCIs at the fixture. This GFCI does not work. Flush the toilets, run the sinks, hot, cold, shower, doors, trim. I look at the bottom of the trim. Interior key deadbolts is a safety hazard. You can't get out during a fire unless you have the key. It really should be a throw. Um, two prong receptacles. Um, they're using a cheater right here, uh, improperly installed. Um, no big deal, but your client ought to know this is an older home and has um, older wiring in it. And they'll be surprised when they try to plug in a three prong device into a two prong receptacle. Not my clients because I tell them. Actually, take a picture and then demonstrate. This is my GFCR tester with the three prongs trying to plug into something with two prongs. Right, so it's not going to work. So the picture really is a thousand words. If I had to describe that in words, I'd be writing all day. Uh, cracked windows, um, some damage, cosmetic stuff, taking pictures of the in interior. This is um, a moisture probe uh, with two probes. Um, it says, it gives me an indication of whether it's damp or not. Um, there's no quantification. I care less about the moisture level. All I want is an audible or a visual indication, and then I can further investigate. So there's no water, which is nice. Um, I'd love to ask if you use an infrared camera, but I'm going to skip that since we're going long in the uh, class. So I just wanted to give you an indication of how many pictures I take and what I take. I even open up the closets and take a picture of the closets. Who knows what's in there? I'm not sure. It's just filled with inspection restrictions, personal items that I'm not required to move. Uh, smoke detector is really old. Any smoke detector that's battery only should be replaced. Um, uh, they're only a couple bucks. Just replace them all, especially the one like this one that is yellow in color. Um, other bathrooms, the showers, I try to force a leak by directing the shower water into the corners. And I tap on the tiles, pound on the tiles with my hand to see if it's soft, see how the grout is. 
try to feel if there's anything moving behind the tile. Missing GFCIs. There's me pounding on the tiles. Hot and cold water. Um, when I was a home inspector, I also was a EPA certified lead hazard risk assessor. That's lead um, based paint. That's a hazard, especially at the window well for small children. Lots of pictures of the interior. There's the fireplace. So there's no damper there, right, at the throat or um, at the chamber. Um, the damper is at the top of the flute, actually. We saw that in the previous picture from the roof. So the, th the component that I saw from the roof is connected to my hand in the living room. So all things are connected. When you have a gas stove, you really ought to exhaust that stuff outside. In fact, there's a code or a standard that says such. And this fan just recirculates all that stuff on the inside. And we have an article about um, kitchen exhausts and how they should all be exhausting outside. Take a look at that. And turn on the oven. Um, one thing that we do in the company is we don't let our hand um, we don't release our hand from the oven door. So you turn on the oven and you just, you're connected to that oven until you turn it off. So you turn off the oven after you're done. And um, that prevents you from letting the oven run uh, all day long. So no water leaks at the garbage disposal. Dishwasher, run a short cycle, no leaks. GFCIs. So I wanted to ask you also if you're qualified to perform other types of inspections which means the question um, um, I want to lead you into all the other certifications that InterNACHI provides to our members. We have over 30 different other certifications. You can join InterNACHI as a member and you have access to all of the training and certifications. Take your time, learn at your own pace, free and online, and you choose which certification you want to be. You want to be a certified mold inspector, you want to be a certified roof inspector, you want to be a certified radon inspector, you want to be a certified home inspector. We have all of those different types of certifications to choose from, from your account. And they're all of those certifications are free and online to members. We have other subjects, such as safety. We teach our inspectors how to be safe during the inspection. We have training courses related to that topic. We have training courses related to business. We have training courses related to home energy, indoor air quality, green building, building science and infrared, report writing, and standards and ethics. We have a lot of training courses. And this URL, um, these URLs are also very important. We're not going to visit them all, but you can take, um, I'll have these slides available to you so you can take a look at them later. But this is all, these are the resources that are available to InterNACHI members while you're a member. So our entire curriculum is at natchiorg forward slash education. Our forum so that you can engage with other inspectors and students. Um, we require all of our students to write short essays on the forum and upload images from inspections. So you can take a look at their images from other inspectors and what they say about the condition um, of the item or component within the image. There's webinars, free live classes, a lot of training videos that are online and free. We have a gallery of illustrations, 3D illustrations to help you um, boost your inspection report. Um, we have a glossary of terms. You should use this um, correct terminology when communicating to your clients. We have a ton of inspection articles for you. So we have a lot of resources. And so I want to leave you with these URLs. We already reviewed them. Um, but the certification one we didn't go to, and that's natchiorg forward slash certification. And there you'll find um, all of the certifications from which to choose. And all of the training and certification courses are free and online to members. So there's um, all of those certifications. Um, I apologize for going over our one hour time. Um, and I see a lot of questions from everyone. Um, if you want to stay for a while, I'm going to try to go through some of the questions, but um, 
Uh, well, let's, let's see how, how fast I can go through. Um, let's see. Someone asks, I'm a new, not yet certified. Does Internachi offer mentors or shadows? And this is recommended when you get started. Um, we do not have a program for um, supervised inspections. What we do have are local trainers, local chapters, and local classes and schools. So depending on where you are, we can help you. So for Florida, for example, or uh, Illinois, take me Illinois, we have many trainers um, in Illinois spread throughout the state, basically all around Chicago, though, um, that will provide supervised inspections. Some do it for free, some do it for a fee. Um, there's very strong chapters throughout the country, some weak ones. Um, in Colorado, there are two strong chapters, and you can go to that chapter and ask other inspectors if you could be their helper. Um, we have a search engine to search for inspectors outside of your market area, which is a good idea, so that you're not um, being shadowed or shadowing your competition, future competition. So you go outside of your market area and um, contact inspectors that way. And it is a good idea, but it's not required. To be an internationally certified home inspector, it's not required to um, participate in a, a supervised inspection. Um, most states that regulate um, home inspectors don't actually require that either. Some do. Illinois is one of them. Um, any thoughts of using a drone on a roof inspection? In California, almost all new homes now and resells are tile, which is very easy to damage by walking on the roof. Right. Um, I kind of like the spectroscope. It's a lot cheaper, a lot easier to maneuver and manage around. Um, drones are really just for fun, uh, the shock and awe of all that stuff. Um, and um, yeah, so I, I would just use the spectroscope. That drone really is just for fun. But I understand the restrictions of walking on tile. You don't want to damage um, someone's property. So there are ways around it um, before you invest in um, an expensive drone. Drones are really just for fun. Do you feel it's valuable time? Um, do you feel, Sean asked, do you feel it is a value of your time as well as the clients to show all the operable and good things of the home? Yep. Um, I actually just show them I like it when my client is with me because I can show them how things work and how they operate and how to maintain them um, and how to save energy, which is uh, the subtitle of the home maintenance book. Um, if I don't get around to showing how something works, it's covered in the home maintenance book. But, um, yeah, I like to show the good stuff as well. Um, but what I think is a really nice home, it's typically completely different from my client's opinion. So they are in love with the home um, that I'm inspecting. And I take that um, opinion with me. But really, um, all I'm there for... What they really want to know is, can I move in to a safe home? And that's the answer that I'm trying to provide. Just want to make sure I find those defects. Um, yep, Aaron asks, uh, do you recommend, what is the, how do you use, I get, um, recommend versus repair and replace? Um, how do you communicate your findings in your report? So we have an inspection report course, and we give you defects, and we give you suggestions on how to communicate what you recommend. Um, is it monitor? Do you use um, repair? Do you use replace? Uh, do you use further valuation? Um, if you don't know, we have many articles and resources for you, including the world's largest library of inspection report narratives. Um, it, it is for a fee. But it's really good. I think there's over, well, there's 80,000, maybe, maybe even more, um, different types of narratives on how you communicate um, efficiently, concisely, the conditions that you observe. So, you, if you need that information, I can email you. Um, just looking at the questions. 
There's a lot of questions about ICC, um, BPI, so I can take a look at that stuff. One of the things I wanted to mention, and then I think we'll go, because I'm looking at the, the questions, and I can answer them later. Um, the Home Energy Score is a national program um, where all qualified international members can participate in this program. And we made this recent marketing piece. It's a door hanger. So you go down your neighborhood and you hang this on doors. And um, it asks, how, how does your home compare with others? The Home Energy Score is a program with the Department of Energy through InterNACHI where you can score every home. And the score is from 1 to 10. And um, 10 is very efficient. 1 is poorly efficient, wasting energy. And um, it gives your client that score and what they need to do to score better and how much money that's going to cost and how much money they can save. So we have these marketing materials available. You can contact me or Jessica at the marketing department. She's director of marketing. And order a bunch of these and start walking down your neighborhood and pass those out. And see if you can generate um, business and additional service. What I would recommend is um, add value to your existing home inspection service. So provide a home energy score on every home inspection. And it only takes a few more minutes to provide a score. The data that you collect to provide a home energy score is the same stuff that you already inspect for during a home inspection. So it's not additional work in the inspection, it's additional work a few minutes to produce the um, score itself, the report. So consider that. And I think I'm going to say goodbye, everybody. Um, hundreds of you have stuck through over an hour. That's great. I'm going to email everybody a link to the video recording. InterNACHI members, you get one hour CE to upload to your education log. And um, I thank you all very much for being here. My name is Ben Gramico. I'm from InterNACHI. That's the International Association of Certified Home Inspectors. I'll see you next time.